Today I want to talk to you guys about the DJI Mavic 2 and specifically its remote controller. Now in this video I'm going to walk you through the process of repairing the USB port on the side of the remote. Now just to explain what happened to mine last week I went to fly my Mavic 2 and found that the port on the side wasn't working. I couldn't charge it, I couldn't connect it to my phone and I noticed that the port was completely loose moving around and it wouldn't work at all. Now in all honesty I do not know how this has happened because my Mavic 2 has been in its bag pretty much since January due to winter as well as lockdown and it was fine when I put it away however when I took it out uh, it was just instantly loose and not working. Anyway I proceeded to take the remote controller apart have a look what was wrong and in this video I'm going to walk you through the entire process of actually repairing the USB port on the remote just in case you have damaged yours. Now my port itself wasn't actually damaged it had simply broke free from its solder on the PC be. However, if you have damaged yours, you would need to get a new port before actually repairing it. And it is known as a micro type A port if it is looking like it's needing to be replaced. And that is the one you're going to need to get. Anyway, what we're going to do is walk you through the whole process of stripping the remote controller down, repairing it, soldering it, putting it back together and check that it is working. Now, just before I hop into that, if you'd like to support the channel, there are links to the DJI Mavic 2 in the description of this video. There's also a link to PayPal as well if you'd like to support the channel through donations too. Anyway, let's get on with this video. Okay, so the first thing we're gonna to need to do is strip the remote controller. So I'm gonna take the sticks off as well as remove the other ancillary such as the little cable attached on the side just to make sure that it doesn't get damaged. Now, to open the remote, the first thing you need to do is remove these two screws located on the bottom that hold the little plastic covers on under each arm. These are simply standard hex screws and you simply remove them one at a time and then the little plastic cover will then lift off out of the way. Now this can be a little bit tricky to get off and you might need to give it a little bit of a wiggle with a screwdriver but once the screw's out you should find that it will release fairly easily. Once these are removed, this will then allow you to pop the bottom cover off the remote. Now this is held in with little clips all the way around and the simplest way is to put a little bit of pressure under each side popping it upwards away from the remote controller until it breaks free. Now you do need to be a little bit careful when doing this because the plastic is very soft on the remote controller but it will simply pop free and it allows you to remove it and put it safe to one side. Next, you'll need to remove these two screws located in the bottom, and this will actually allow the front face plate to come free on the remote controller. It is simply held in place with these two screws at the bottom, and then it is clipped in around the top. So these two need to come out first of all. Next, before doing anything else, you will need to disconnect these two connectors that go from the gimbals down to the main bottom board because the gimbals actually come free with the top of the remote controller itself. Now, you need to be very careful with these because these are very, very thin wires. I was using a very small set of tweezers to be able to pop them out. However, it is worth doing it very gently, very slowly, and you simply give the connector a little bit of a tug and it will break free nice and easily. The next thing you will then need to do is remove the 5D button at the top. Now it is worth noting on mine this was actually glued tight in place and it is quite difficult to get out. I ended up prising it out from actually underneath the remote controller however you will see that the shaft of the button has actually come off with mine and we'll take a look at that a little bit more later on in the video. Next, you will then need to simply lift the face of the remote controller and gently separate it from the back half. Now, there are clips that go all the way around the side on the remote that hold the top section attached to the bottom. Now, the simplest way to do this is get yourself a plastic pry tool and gently get in the gap, trying to twist it open as you do it all the way around the remote controller, up the side, and then do it along the top as well until the top of the remote controller actually breaks free. 
Once the top actually breaks free, you can then gently lift it off and place it to one side safely out of the way. Looking inside the remote, you will see that there are two connection cables, one on each side that will need to be removed. And then you have six screws that hold this top PCB to the bottom section of the remote controller. Now, when removing these cables, you do need to be very, very careful. These are ribbon cables and they are easily damaged. The one on the left is actually held on with a little screw bracket. So you do need to be careful on that one just to make sure that you don't damage it. Now, to remove the one on the right, you simply flip the little lever up on the back of the connector and then gently pop out the ribbon cable from its connector, being sure not to damage it or bend it too much as you're doing it. For the cable on the left, you then simply need to take a small Phillips screwdriver and then remove the Phillips screws, releasing the clamp off the top and then remove the cable itself from the bracket. Now it is worth noting as you are removing these screws they are very very small and having a rubber mat like this with specific places for things really does help when you're doing a job like this. Once the two screws are removed you can then simply lift off the little L-shaped bracket and this will then show the cable connector hiding below. You then simply need to gently prise the connector upwards to free it from the board being very careful not to damage it as you're doing it and then gently place the cable out of the way once it pops free. The next thing to do is remove the six screws that hold the little PCB board on that goes around the display. Now this is the board that the actual USB connector is soldered to and it is soldered to it underneath. So you need to just remove the four screws, two on either side of the LCD and then remove the bottom two screws located below the LCD. Once the final screw was removed, I'm then able to lift the PCB and place it out of the way safely. Now, the USB connector should be attached to the bottom of this board. However, as you can see, it is still in place on my remote, and that is because it has come free from the PCB. Now, after further inspection, it appears that it is simply broke free from its solder. The reason for this is usually due to poor quality lead free solder being used on the boards and all you then have to do is apply a little bit of pressure or a little bit of force and unfortunately the connector will break free. Now for me there was no damage to the board or the connector it had simply just broke free of its solder. So for the next task was to clean everything up clean that lead free solder from the pads and then begin to reattach the connector. So the first thing I did was add plenty of flux and that is simply to make sure that the solder goes where we want it to and it also helps to clean up those pads as we tin them as well. So what I'm doing here is simply tinning the pads with 6040 or 6337 leaded solder, removing that lead free solder or at least mixing it down with quality solder and cleaning the pads up as I'm doing it. Now the key to doing this is having plenty of flux. I cannot stress how important flux is. It really does help keep the solder going where you want it to and it stops it bridging over those connectors when you're doing it. So it's simply plenty of solder, plenty of flux. Next, once I'd finished doing that bit, it was time then to clean up the pads and use some desoldering braid to remove all of that excess solder that I've put on, but then help remove that lead free solder that is remaining on the pads to give myself a good solid connection ready to put the connector back in place. Now when you are doing this you do need to be very very careful. It is very easy to lift a pad off the PCB or damage one if you put too much force on. The solder braid is also very handy for pulling the solder out of the holes that the brackets on the side of the connector go into as well and that's simply what I'm doing here is simply heating it up over the tops of the holes and sucking that solder out ready to place the the connector on. 
Once all the old solder is removed and the PCB is ready to go, we need to clean it with some isopropyl alcohol on the end of a cotton wool bud, getting all of the pads nice and clean, ready to accept the connector. Now, when you are using cotton wool buds, do just watch for any little bits of hairs, and it's just worth giving it a rub down quickly first. So what we're going to do is put a little bit of flux on and place the connector in its correct location on the PCB. Now, there are two little legs that come off the top of this connector and go through into those two holes that you can see at the bottom of the board and it's simply a game of placing the connector on giving it a gentle push to get the pins to go through the holes hold them in place and then you simply want to hold the connector on and tag it to make sure that it won't move around whilst you're trying to solder the rest of it so we're simply going to hold it down with a pair of tweezers and then add some solder onto the side of the connector where the pins go into the PCB to tag it down in place and hold it nice and solid now you do need to make sure that you get plenty of heat into it at this point but you don't want too much heat that you're going to melt the plastic inside the connector itself so you do need to be a little bit careful but we're simply going to keep placing a little bit of heat on until the solder melts and I'm happy that the connector is held in place nice and solid. Once I've done that I'm going to, go to apply a little bit more flux to the back and then we're going to very carefully solder each of the pins on the back. Now it's quite hard to show you this without a microscope but what I've got is plenty of flux and I'm simply applying a small amount of solder and rubbing it across the connections. Now you do need to be very careful doing this to make sure that you don't bridge the connectors. The reason I'm doing it this way is I didn't really have a fine enough nib on the end of the iron but you are able to make sure that the solder doesn't bridge as long as you use plenty of flux. Once you're happy with the connections you then simply tag the rest of the connector down on the board making sure that it is nice and solid on all sides to make sure that it won't break free again in the future and this is sort of where the cause of the problems was in the first place because there wasn't enough solder on the corners of the connector that actually hold it down to the PCB so for me it was a task of just making sure I got plenty of solder on each side being very careful not to touch any other components and then tag it down so I won't get this problem again in the future. Once finished, it's then time to inspect your work, make sure everything looks correct on both the connector and the pins, and it all looks as it should. Once you've done, it's then time to clean the board up, and the best way to do this is with some isopropyl alcohol. I've got a small spray bottle, and I simply spray the board over and give it a clean with a cotton wool bud, just removing that excess flux that I was adding in the soldering process, and making sure that the board is nice and clean and it's got nothing on it ready to be fitted back into the remote. Just showing you a close look at how it turned out you can see all five pins on the back of the connector are soldered nicely and the four corners are tagged down very well to the pcb with plenty of solder making sure that i don't get this problem happen again so the next job is to simply put the remote back together and test that the connection is actually working so we're going to put the pcb back into the remote connecting up the cable on both sides and then actually check that the USB port is working properly because you do need to make sure it is working before actually assembling it. Making sure that when you put the board back in that the USB hole on the side fits in nicely in place. So we're simply going to plug the USB connector in check that the remote charges which it does and then I'm going to check that it does connect properly to my phone making sure that it's not only got power but it is transferring data as well so I'm simply going to connect it to my iPhone via the little USB cable that DJI supply turn the remote controller on and then check that it detects the remote controller and that it is communicating correctly Now you'll know when it's connected properly because the enter device will turn blue and you'll get the message along the top that it's checking for the firmware and various things like that. As you can see, mine was working fine. So it was now simply a task of reversing what we did at the start, which is put all the screws back in for the board, reconnect the connections, simply then 
put the remote controller back together in reverse order of how we took it apart. Now, before we do that, it is worth making sure that you do clean your LCD screen because you've probably ended up putting a fingerprint on it like I have. And the last thing you want to do is put it back together and see that fingerprint on at the end. Now, when you do put the top cover plate on, you simply pop them in place and then give them a push down in all the top edges and it will then simply click in place. And you do want to make sure all your buttons work correctly as well before doing it giving it a push down, then putting the two screws in either side, as we did when we took it apart. Next, you then need to connect the gimbals back into their connections very carefully on the left and the right hand side. Now, again, the best thing for this is using a pair of tweezers and gently push the connections back into the little black connectors on both sides. Otherwise, your gimbals will not work. Then it's simply a task of putting the bottom cover back on the remote controller and pushing this in place, clipping it in to make sure it's held correctly. And then putting the two covers on either side below the arms and putting in the last two screws. The last thing to do then is fit the 5D button. Now, as I said, on mine, it actually pulled out the shaft out of the button assembly. Now, this isn't actually broke and it will push back in. However, it goes in a bit looser than it was originally. What I actually did on mine was put a little bit of silicon on the bottom of the piece and then placed it into the hole, pushing it in place so it slots in correctly and then allowing that to go off just to hold it in place over time. And my button is working absolutely fine. But it is worth noting that when you do take this off, it might actually look like you've broke it. But if you're very careful, you can actually put it back. And that is it for this video. If the info has been helpful, please do consider hitting that subscribe button and hit the little bell next to it as well to get updates on any videos that I release in the future. As I said, my remote is now fixed. It's all working as it should be. Again, I simply think that the solder is very soft because it is lead free solder and the port simply broke free from the board. If you did need to get it, as I said, the port is known as micro A and you can get it, but you do need to have some fairly decent soldering skills to be able to do this, but it is achievable if your device is out of warranty. That is it for this video. As I said, if you'd like to support the channel, there is a link to the Mavic 2 in the description. Thank you very much for watching and I will release another video again soon.